especially as it pertains to our mouth. Have you ever prayed in the morning, Lord, set a watch over my mouth? Set a watch over my mouth. Guard my lips. I like what the Puritan prayer says in the Valley of Vision. If today were my last day, let it be my best day. Let my words be the best words I could speak. Those would be great prayers to pray before you get out of your prayer closet, right? In the morning. And just what are we to put on in the inner woman? Well, Paul is going to give us eight virtues that we should be putting on, especially as it pertains to our speech. So here we are. We are going to look at Colossians 3, 12 through 14. Notice what he writes here. Colossians 3, 12 to 14. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, tender mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing with one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. And above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Now, last night, we looked at six deadly sins of the mouth that we need to put off, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of our mouth, and lying. We also saw three motivations for putting these sins to death. The old woman is gone, right? That's not who we are anymore. Secondly, we're being renewed in the knowledge of God. And thirdly, we looked at the different classifications of people and saw that these sins um, are often hurled at those who are different than us. And we saw that there are no distinctions with God and there should be none with us. That's the third motivation for putting off those sins. Now, there is a reason Paul mentions the sins we are to put off before he mentions the virtues that we are to put on with our mouth. Now that we have rid ourselves of all these sins of our mouth, we have to figure out, okay, so if I can't use my mouth for lying and foul speech <laughs> and anger, <laughs> What do I use my mouth for? Well, he's going to tell us. It's just like, uh, ladies, when you pe take off a filthy uh, uh, garment, uh, you want to, you know, get yourself clean before you put on a, you know, a nice garment, right? Uh, can you put, imagine, put a beautiful wedding dress over some smelly, sweaty workout clothes? You wouldn't do that, right? You're going to take off those smelly clothes, and you're going to take a shower before you put on your wedding garment. So now that we have put to death these ugly sins, what should we put on? Well, Paul begins in verse 12, and notice what he writes. He says, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on these things. And notice, first of all, he says, therefore, or because of the fact that you should put off these ugly sins, now, therefore, because you are elect, what does that mean? It means being chosen from a number. Ladies, we have been elect according to the foundation of the world, Paul says in Ephesians. God elected you before the foundation of the world that you should be holy and without blame before him in love. And so we need to act like God's elect, right? And yet we have many today that are not glorifying God with their speech. And so Paul says, because you are elect of God, you're not an elect of God, but notice what else he says, you're holy. What does that mean? It means you have been set apart for God. And so, ladies, when we think about being holy and being set apart for God, we want speech that's going to reflect our image bearer, right? Uh, would Jesus say this? And if Jesus would not say what you're getting ready to say, you probably shouldn't say it, right? Because we're, we're set apart for him. And so we act like him. And so he says, you're not only elect of God, but you're holy. And then Paul reminds them so graciously, you've also been loved by God. This is agapeo. It's a direction of one's will and finding their joy in something. Ladies, that should blow your socks off if you have any on. You probably don't because you're in Florida, but this lady right here has socks on. But um, that God loves you. We were talking about that in the car this morning coming here from the, the hotel. God loves us. <laughs> Ladies, because he loved us, then we owe him something, right? He elected us, he's called us to be holy, and he loves us. We are objects of his love. In fact, the word beloved here is in the perfect tense, which means he will continue to love you now and forever. Isn't that amazing? No one can pluck you out of the Father's hand. 
Again, what a blessedness. We should let that really sink in. But ladies, because we're elect, because we're loved of God, then we have a responsibility. And our responsibility is to be holy, to be set apart. And yes, even in our speech. What does Peter say? As he who has called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of life. Why? Because it's written, be holy for I am holy holy. So part of the fruit that we are to bear are the virtues that Paul mentions here in Colossians. Because we are his daughters and we represent him, then we must dress our inner woman in a manner that pleases him. And I'm not going to be talking about clothes today, but I will say this. I also believe that we as God's daughters should be dressing outwardly in a manner that pleases him. And I'm very thankful as I look around that all of you are dressed modestly. Uh, that does not always happen in a lot of places I go. And uh, so it's a little bit distracting. I remember one time a couple ladies sitting here on the front row and half their chest was hanging out and it was... You know, I wanted to say something, but I restrained my mouth. And, uh, but anyway, I, I am thankful that you're dressing in a way that honors the Lord. And, and we do want to dress outwardly in a way that pleases the Lord, don't we? But uh, we do want to be concerned also about the inner woman. So notice how Paul says, he says, put on therefore, put on therefore as God's elect. Interesting Greek word, put on. It means to envelop to clothe. It has the sense of sinking into a garment. I love what one man says. He says it, it means to become so possessed with the mind of Christ as in thought, feeling, and action that you resemble him and as it were, you reproduce the life he lived. End of quote. Now, this word put on is in the aorist tense in the Greek, which means this command must be obeyed at once. <laughs> no dallying around. We talked about this last night. A lot of believers say, you know, uh, in fact, I have a lady right now, she's kind of debating with me about obedience, and she goes, you know, I just don't see that in Scripture. And I go, well, I see it everywhere, you know? And uh, it's like, man, where, why do you not see it? It's in every book of the Bible, almost every verse of the Bible. We are to be obedient, right, to what God's commanded us to do. But uh, she's going back and forth with me on that. And that's what Paul's saying here. Don't dally around. Do this. Put on these things once and for all and don't put it off. Uh, I know a lot of people say, well, I'm just working on one sin at a time. Well, where's that in Scripture? Uh, I, I don't know where that is. We are to put these virtues on and we should do it now. When, you're, when you tell your children, get ready for bed, go brush your teeth, pick up your clothes, you mean right now, right? And, and ladies, if you don't mean right now, you need to rethink your parenting because children should obey the spoken word with the joyful heart, as Elizabeth Elliot says. So you don't mean tomorrow, you mean right now. And that's what Paul is saying here. Do it now. Do it right now now. So the first virtue with our mouth that we are to put on, notice what he says, is tender mercies or bowels of compassion. In the Greek language, bowels would represent your intestines, like uh, even your spleen, your gallbladder. And so it, be, it became a word that meant those deep feelings of our heart, like anger or love. Mercy here is compassion or kindness. We are to put on a heart of compassion or heartfelt compassion. Uh, we should exemplify our Father who is full of compassion and tender mercies. Ladies, how does this affect our speech? When we see the hurts of others, it should cause us to do something. Mercy is action. We do something. A, a great example of this is the Good Samaritan. Uh, remember the story of the Good Samaritan? This man was beaten up, wounded, had these open wounds, and he was left for dead. And a uh, Levite comes by and walks on the other side of him. Priest comes by, walks on the other side of him, the religious leaders of the day, mind you. And then this Samaritan comes by. And he sees the guy there. He's hurt. He's wounded. He pours oil and wine into his wounds. He, he finds an innkeeper. And here's his kind words of mercy. He says to him, he says, you know, I, I'm, I'm continuing on my journey, but here's some money. 
and uh, take care of this man. And when I come back from my journey, uh, if you need more, I'll give you more. Those are kind words, aren't they? Uh, the Levite didn't even say anything. The priest didn't even say anything. They just snubbed their nose and walked by. Kind of showed the inner attitude of their heart, right? As we talked last night, our mouth really reveals what's in our heart, right? And here the good Samaritan, he had a good heart. And Samaritan of all people, you know, they were hated by the Jews. And uh, he did the right thing and he spoke kind words, kind words, words full of mercy. The second virtue we are to put on, notice what Paul says, is kindness. This word means gentle, a gracious disposition. It was used to describe wine which had grown mellow with age and had lost its harshness. Now, ladies, kindness is not to be just shown towards your best friend. Uh, you should be kind to all. Remember, God sends rain on the just and the unjust, and he's kind to what? even the evil. He is kind to even those who are evil. I know uh, before I became a believer, uh, my husband used to remind me often of the meaning of my name, Susan, which is tender lily. And so kindly he would say, tender lily, tender lily. What was he doing? He was reminding me I wasn't being very kind with my tone of voice. And uh, so we're to be kind. Remember we talked last night about the virtuous woman. She opens her mouth with wisdom and on her tongue is what? The law of kindness. Uh, I know that's a big thing now. I've noticed on Southwest Airlines, they did it again yesterday. As you go, be kind. Uh, kind of be, seems the mantra of our day. Why? Because people are not very kind anymore. Have you noticed how rude people are and angry and bitter and they snap at you? And uh, even if you're going to, into a, a store to buy something or you're talking to somebody on the phone and you're trying to get, you know, some help with a service or something, people are just not kind anymore. But ladies, for God's children, that is one of the best ways that you can glorify God with your speech. Be kind. Have your words be kind. Um, we need to be women who use our speech for speaking words that are kind. The third virtue we are to clothe ourselves with, notice what Paul says, is humility. Humility. Humility is having a humble opinion of yourself, a deep sense of your littleness, a lowliness of mind. It's a person who doesn't think highly of themselves or better than that, they just don't think of themselves at all. Now that's hard, isn't it? I mean, what's the first thing you thought of this morning when you got out of bed? Probably yourself, right? Got to go to the bathroom, got to get my coffee. Whatever. What is today? You know, you're thinking of yourself. It's interesting to note the Greeks never applied this word to themselves. In fact, they have no symbol in the Greek language for humility. <laughs> they didn't seek it. Not very many people seek humility today either, right? I mean, it's hard to think of somebody that you know that's really humble, right? Right? Humility is not a virtue that we seek. I remember walking, or not walking, driving by a, a Christian college in my hometown. I use that word loosely because it's not very Christian. It's a word of faith college. But uh, they had a big marquee and it was announcing their ladies' conference for the weekend. And the theme of the ladies' conference was, it's all about me. And I'm like, well, that describes the word of faith movement pretty well, right? It's all about me. Thank you, Teresa, for not entitling this conference. It's all about me. But it's really hard to, it's, isn't it hard to be around someone who always is talking about themselves? Very prideful, very arrogant. I was looking at someone's uh, Instagram, I think it was last night, and uh, she's a speaker, but it was just, she was just promoting herself. Promoting yourself. It's all about me. It's kind of nauseating, isn't it? It should be about him, right? And ladies, we should have words that are humble. What did Paul say? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. And what? He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of a cross. Ladies, and that's supposed to be our mindset. Let this mind be in you which was also in him. Humble yourself. Humility is not only seen in our Lord, but it's also exemplified. This is one of the best examples in scripture of using your mouth 
for either pride or humility. Listen to this. And you know, really what comes out of our mouth is what's in our heart, right? But remember the, the parable that Jesus spoke of in Luke 18 when he talked about the people who trust in themselves and he talks about the two men that go up to the temple to pray. Remember the Pharisee? And remember the other one was a tax collector? And here's the Pharisee's proud words. He stands and he prays with himself. I love that. He pray, he's praying really to himself. He's not even praying to God. God, I thank you. <laughs> I'm not like him. <laughs> Why, I, you know, I give my tithe and I do this and I do that. It's all about him. This is what I do, Lord. Aren't I great? I'm so wonderful. Aren't you glad you have me in your kingdom? I mean, I'm paraphrasing. He was just like so full of himself. And remember the tax collector? He wouldn't even lift his eyes up to heaven and he smote himself on the breast. And what did he say? God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And what did Jesus say? That man, the tax collector, he went down to his house justified. But not that man. He says those who what? Exalt themselves, the Pharisee, they'll be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. Ladies, our mouths really express what's in our heart. And I would encourage you sometime, when you're with a group of people, especially women, listen to what comes out of their mouth. Uh, I remember one time being at a conference and uh, I was sitting at a table like this with women eating lunch and there were the male speakers over here sitting and I heard one of the, the speakers over here, I'm not pointing at any of you girls, so no, I'm not pointing the finger, but anyway, I heard one of the men say uh, to the other men, male speakers, he said, uh, you don't know me, you don't know who I am. He said, well, I've written all these books and I travel with so-and-so, really, you don't know me, you've never heard of me? And I, I just, I looked at his name tag and I'd never heard of him before. And, and, uh, and I, I asked Debbie later, I said, did you hear that guy? And she goes, no, I was paying attention over here. I said, well, I can, I can multitask. I can listen here, but I can hear that. And so I thought, I'm not going to go to any of his sessions. What an arrogant man. You don't know me? Well, a couple of years later, it came out. He was committing adultery with multiple women and he lost his ministry over it. Ladies, pride goes before a fall. Pride goes before a fall. But our words that come out of our mouth really reveal what's in our heart. So you might stop sometime and, and listen to yourself. What are you saying? What are you saying to others? Are your words prideful? Are they arrogant? Do you think more of yourself than you should? Uh, ladies, you need to remember from where you've come from, right? Out of the pit, and God saved you. Well... The fourth virtue on our what to wear list is meekness, meek words. Meekness is inward grace of the soul, a spirit in which we accept God's dealing with us as good without disputing or resisting. It not only deals with our attitude towards God, but even when we're not treated like we want to be treated. Someone who is meek is willing to suffer injury rather than inflict it. I want to give you a great example of this. It happened to me right after my husband passed away. Debbie and I had 12 speaking engagements back to back right after he passed away. One of them, uh, I was in a, 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 a city and uh, met two widows. Both had lost their husbands a year before my husband passed away. This lady here, she came up to Deb and I, full of grace, mercy, shining the glory of God, gave us a loaf of bread she'd made, so kind, and I was like, wow, that's, you know, she just lost her husband a year, what a sweet lady. This lady over here, she was with her daughter, and uh, she had lost her husband around the same time this lady had, and she said, I'm mad at God, I'm angry at God. She said, he didn't heal my husband, why didn't he heal my husband? She said, I haven't even picked up my Bible in a year. And uh, I tried that weekend to talk to her, both her and her daughter, who were very bitter. And I remember leaving there, and I told Debbie, I said, I don't want to be like that woman. I don't want to be like that woman. I want to be like that woman. Ladies, that's what, what meekness is. It's, it's dealing with whatever God gives you with the right attitude. And again, that lady's heart was being revealed. I'm mad at God. I'm not even going to read his word. I'll just show him. Ladies, that is not a spirit of meekness. Meekness is someone who's willing to suffer injury rather than inflict it. Now, I will say this about meekness. Meekness is not weakness. 
Meekness is strength under control. Remember who is the meekest man in all the world in the Old Testament? Moses. <laughs> How did he exemplify meekness? Well, he went before Pharaoh 10 times, said, let my people go. I mean, he wasn't weak. He was strong. And uh, you look at Moses and you go, how did you put up with not only Pharaoh, but those murmuring Israelites? How did you do that? They drive me crazy. <laughs> and it was that strength under control. Remember what Paul told Timothy? He says, oh, man of God, follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Also, ladies, when you're going to confront a brother or sister in Christ, according to Galatians 6, 1, Paul says, you who are spiritual, restore each other with the spirit of what? Meekness. So when you go and confront a brother or a sister who's in sin, you do it with meekness. Your mouth should speak words of meekness, not weakness. Meekness, strength under control. Uh, I heard a pastor, I was listening to one of his sermons. He was one of our candidates uh, this last year. We've had 14 candidates, and the Lord's graciously just given us a great pastor. But uh, I heard one of his sermons. Debbie and I were listening to it in the car, and he said, I told you all this last year. And I'm like, oh, Lord, please don't give us that guy. And uh, I was like, that is not meekness. That is not strength under control. But again, what comes out of our mouth shows whether we are meek or not, right? Do we have that strength under control? And ladies, I will tell you, for those of you that are married, that's what your husband wants. He wants a woman with a meek and quiet spirit. It's not weakness, strength under control. He doesn't want you to be a wimp. He doesn't want you to be a, you know, a doormat. If he does, then you better uh, lovingly confront him. But uh, he wants you to have strength under control. Uh, for example, if you go home this afternoon and or to, whenever we get finished here and, and your husband says, hey, while well, you've been at that ladies conference, you know, he said, uh, uh, you know, I've decided we're going to move to New York City in a couple weeks. And a woman who's not meek says, are you out of your ever loving mind? What is wrong with you? You know, why do you want to, you know, and you go and that is not meek. That is not meekness. But you'll go, a woman who has a meek spirit and who has strength under control say, really, honey, um, why do you want to go to New York? Do you know who their governor is? Uh, can, can we please pray about this for a few weeks? And, uh, you know, I think, I think maybe while I was gone, this, the heat got to you or something, but, but uh, could we pray about this for a few weeks and then could we talk about it again? I, this, I'm so surprised. And so there's a difference, you know, and I had to learn after salvation how to speak to my husband uh, because I was not a meek woman. I was more like the other one. And uh, I remember one time I came into his office and had to talk to him about something. And as I left, he said, Susan, I not only thank you for your rebuke, but for how you did it. And so I finally learned meekness, strength under control. And so ladies, we want to use our mouth for that, right? Have strength, be a strong woman. Your husband wants a strong woman. He does, but he wants you under control, not out of control. So uh, we need to learn about that. Well, the fifth quality that needs to be put on in our mouth is long-suffering. Long-suffering. This word describes a person who is not easily provoked by others and does not get angry. We looked at anger last night. Many times it expresses patience under abusive treatments of others. Um, so we refuse to yield to outbursts of anger. Uh, this would be someone who does not allow himself to be provoked by people or become angry. In fact, the word means a long holding out of your mind before it gives room to action or passions. A good example of this in the scripture is Hosea. He is very long suffering. Remember his wife, Gomer, committed adultery and uh, he went and he graciously with long suffering brought her back home. And of course, it was an example of, of uh, Israel and um, God, Israel's unfaithfulness, but he brought her back home and he set boundaries there. He was very long suffering towards her, even though she was an unfaithful wife. Well, we move on to number six in our best dressed list of our mouth. And the next verse, notice what Paul says in verse 13. He says, we are to bear with one another. This is the sixth way that we use our mouth to glorify God. That is to bear with one another. Bearing with one another has the idea of holding out when burdens are heaped up. 
Ladies, we should be willing to put up with each other, and that can be difficult at times, right? Because often we want to use our mouth to tell people off. Have you ever wanted to use your mouth to tell somebody off? Like, I'm just going to give them a good piece of my mind, right? No. We are to bear with one another. Be long-suffering. Ladies, think before you speak. Taste your words before you speak. Make sure your words are with long-suffering and patience. As the poem goes, to live above with the saints we love, that will be glory. But to live below with the saints below, or below that's another story, right? And uh, so sometimes it's challenging. Um, we're all different. We're not made out of the same mold. God made us all different. But ladies, we should have a desire uh, to live with one another in harmony and unity and be long-suffering with each other. Well, Paul moves on to the seventh and probably one of the most difficult things for us to wear, and that is forgiveness. Notice what he says. We are to forgive one another, and then he tells us why we might need to forgive each other. Notice what he says. If anyone has a complaint or an argument with each other, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Now, obviously, this is not the only reason we might need to express forgiveness with our mouth towards someone. But here in this text, he's talking about having an argument with someone, having a complaint against someone. And so, ladies, when you go and you ask for forgiveness or you're making restitution with your speech, you don't say, I forgive you but I know you're going to do it again. Is that how you glorify God with your speech? No, Peter asked the Lord, he said, Lord, how often shall I forgive my brother? Seven times seven, 49 times. And Jesus said, no, Peter, how about 70 times seven? How about 490 times? How about 490 times, Peter, you forgive your brother for the same offense? Now, ladies, I was married for 46 years, six days shy of 46 years. And I don't know that my husband committed the same evil or offense towards me. He was not an evil man. He was a good godly man, but he didn't sin against me in the same way 490 times. And I lived with him, so he would probably be the one to sin against me the most. But he didn't sin against me 490 times in the same offense. But have you and I committed the same offense towards God 490 times? Have you committed the same sin? I'm sure you've told 490 lies in your lifetime even as a believer, right? And so we're to forgive in the same measure that Christ has forgiven us. And yet he's forgiven us of all that sin. And so it's like, I do forgive you. When you go and you express forgiveness and someone comes to you and says, will you forgive me? You don't say, you don't bring up all their shortcomings. You say, you know what? I will forgive you. I will forgive you. And, and you show that with kindness and love. I do forgive you. I've been forgiven so much from the Lord. How can I not forgive you? Um, you know, in Galatians, it talks about uh, Paul and Peter. They had a pretty good argument, remember? Uh, when Peter was come to Antioch, Paul said, I was stood him to the face because he was to be blamed. <laughs> they had a pretty good argument. And their, what their argument was about was whether to take John Mark, or that was another one, John Mark on a trip. According to Acts 15, Barnabas had an uh, uh, they had a dis, uh, argument as well. But there must have been a change toward the heart of Paul towards the end of his life. Because he says what? Bring John Mark with you. Bring him with you. Um, and in Yodi and Syndicate, maybe they had, they had a pretty good argument, it sounds like, right? Uh, he says, I beseech you to help Yodi and Syndicate and all of you people get together and help these two women. They can't get along in the church at Philippi. There was a pretty good argument there too. Ladies, Christians are not exempt from arguments. But th what Paul is saying here is that when you have an argument with someone or a complaint against someone, you try and make restitution and what? You forgive them and you do it with kind words. And if you have trouble with this, um, I think you would do well to do some study in the scripture because we have examples other than our Lord of people who had to forgive of some horrific things. Um, I think about Joseph who was um, thrown into a pit. Uh, he was sold into slavery. You know, he was envied by his brothers and so they treated him maliciously. 
and then he was taken in to Potiphar's house, and he became, uh, you know, quickly a leader there. And remember, his wife, uh, Potiphar's wife, wanted to have sex with Joseph. She goes after him day after day after day, and finally he had enough sense, and he, he got out, and he suffered for it. He had to go to prison for that. All these things were crazy that happened to him. And he comes to the end of his life after he is restored with his brothers and his dad, and his dad dies, and his brothers are terrified because now, you know, Joseph knows the truth, and he's probably going to do evil to us because of what we did to him. We, we put him in the pit and sold him into slavery. And remember, Joseph, what he said to him, he says, he says, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. And he forgave them. He forgave them and loved them. I mean, that's a, I don't know of anybody here that's been thrown into a pit and sold into slavery, right? That's pretty horrific. In fact, I often take women who are coming out of abusive situations to the story of Joseph. He forgave them. You meant it for evil, God meant it for good. Also, Stephen, another one we can look at. Uh, he hardly had been in ministry very long, and he preaches this sermon in Acts chapter 7. He gives a thousand years of Israel's history. And uh, at the end of his, his sermon, this, this beautiful sermon in Acts 7, and he says, you stiff neck, you uncircumcised in heart, you always resist the Holy Spirit. And they didn't like his message. So they take up these huge stones and they start throwing them at Stephen. And he knows he's going to die. I mean, he's falling to the ground. He's, he's got these big wounds on him. He's caught falling to the ground. And the Greek there is he's shrieking like a raven. And he looks up into heaven and he says, sees Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. And he says, Father, forgive him. <laughs> they don't know what they're doing. And he dies. And Saul is standing there consenting to his death. Uh, amazing story. Ladies, you think you've had a bad day. I mean, and yet Stephen says, I forgive him. Father, forgive him. They don't know what they're doing. Ladies, we need to be women who are forgiving. And we need to express that with our speech. And we need to mean it, that it comes from our heart. If this is hard for you, I'm going to give you three helps if um, this is difficult for you. Because I do meet women that are bitter, very bitter. And uh, they do not forgive. And ladies, you cannot. You've been forgiven so much. How can you not forgive? I've, in my uh, 37 years as a Christian, I've had some really, I think, horrific things happen to me uh, that were hard and hurtful. But you know, I can honestly stand before you this morning and say I have no ill will in my heart towards anyone. And it's not me. It's Christ in me that gives me the power to forgive and move on and not hold bitterness. But if this is hard for you, uh, I would give you three practical steps. Number one, first confess it to the Lord. Lord, you know I'm having a hard time forgiving this person. Lord, please help me to mend this relationship. I want, I want this relationship restored. Father, help me. The second thing you should do is, if you can, go to the person and seek forgiveness, seek reconciliation. As much as lies within you, live peaceably with all men. Now, ladies, I will tell you, I've lived long enough. Some people will not make restitution. They just will not. Um, I've even got people now in my life that will not talk to me. They will not talk to me. I've tried to make restitution with them. I've tried to appeal to them. They will not. Uh, I remember my husband's second church. He planted three churches in the 50 years he preached. And the second church, he had to resign over a church discipline issue. The elders wouldn't back him on. And I remember going to one of the elders' houses. We wanted to talk to he and his wife and try to figure out what in the world had gone on, what went wrong, how did this happen. And we're ringing the doorbell. We see them in their den. They see it's us, and they run to the back of the house, and they just wouldn't talk to us. So, I mean, what do you do with that? So there are times like that that you can't make re reconciliation. Some people will just not do it. But I tell you, I fear for them. I fear for people like that. Because James says if we don't show mercy, we will not be extended mercy on Judgment Day. And that's terrifying. Uh, I, I, I don't understand genuine believers who refuse to try and settle differences. I've just never understood that. And it's no wonder that people say, the church is full of what? <laughs> Hypocrites. Because sometimes by that, we're, we're not showing the world what genuine Christianity looks like. Uh, we should be willing to go as far as we can to make restitution. But, all, but ladies, always remember, there are some people that will not do it. 
They just will not do it. So you can have a clear conscience before God. You've done everything as much as lies within you to make it right. And then you have to move on. Don't let it weigh you down. And the third thing that you can do is to overcome evil with good. Do something for somebody. Uh, that person that has wronged you, that has offended you, uh, go the extra mile. Jesus says, where your treasure is, there's your heart. Give them something. Uh, do something kind for them. But ladies, whatever you do, don't be bitter. Uh, if you are, resentment will set in. It'll rob you of your joy. And let me say this, uh, because a lot of women do this. Avoidance is not forgiveness. Avoiding the person is not forgiveness. A lot of people say, well, I'll just avoid that person. Uh, avoidance is not forgiveness. Well, after we've dressed ourselves with tender mercy, kindness, humility of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearance, and forgiveness, you would think, okay, that's it. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm dressed. I'm ready to go, but not quite yet. <laughs> There's one more article that must go on above all others. Ladies, it's like putting on your shoes and your socks, your underwear and your slip but forgetting the most important garment, and that's the main one. I'm glad you all have the main garment on this morning. Your jeans, your capris, your, your dress, your skirt, whatever, right? Uh, you wouldn't think of going out in public without that last garment on, would you? Or would you? <laughs> Hope not. <laughs> Neither should we in the Christian life. We should not think about putting on all those wonderful virtues with our mouth without the last one. This is the most important one. It's above the rest. It is love. And ladies, this is the eighth piece of clothing that we must wear. Notice what he says in verse 14. But above all these things, put on love. Put on love. What's he saying? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know, you can tell someone with your mouth, I forgive you. You can tell someone, you know, from your mouth, you can show kindness with your mouth. But if it's not coming, if it's just legalism, if it's not coming from genuine love from your heart, you might as well trash it, right? Though I give my body to be burned and have not love, I am what? Nothing. I'm Zippo. So ladies, if you don't genuinely love people, it doesn't matter what you say with your mouth. They're going to realize you're a big fake, right? It's not coming from genuine love. Love. Love is the binding factor here that holds all these virtues together. One man said, love embraces and knits together all these virtues. It's the garment, it's the girdle that holds these virtues together. And ladies, love is the hardest thing, isn't it? It's a virtue that is not sought after. Love is the harder attribute. It's the one that focuses on our heart, the inner man. Legalism, we can all do that, right? That's what false teachers do. That's what false converts do. That focuses on the outer man. But love focuses on the inward heart. And I think it is interesting, these eight virtues that Paul mentions here, it's easy to understand why he writes this specifically to the church at Colossae, because if you know anything about the church at Colossae, they were steeped in false teaching, Gnosticism, asceticism, mysticism, angel worship. And so Paul is getting to the heart of the issue. Well, let me ask you, do these eight characteristics describe you? When was the last time you extended tender mercy with your mouth towards someone? Have your words been kind this week? In conversations, do you find yourself wanting to talk about you? Or do you find yourself wanting to know about others? That actually amazes me. Debbie and I have talked about this and all the women through the years that we've discipled. Very few ever ask anything. They just, you know, about you. They want to just talk about themselves. Uh, it's, it's very interesting what, how narcissistic we've all become, right? It's all about us. Are you a woman who's exhibit, exhibited by meekness that has strength under control? Do you find yourself irritated most of the time? Or do you bear long with others and with difficult situations? Do you endure under hardships and with difficult people? Is there anyone that you're not extending forgiveness to? Is agape love the motive for showing tender mercy, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, forbearance, and forgiveness? What a wardrobe for us to wear, especially as we think about our speech. 
Tender mercies are better than taffeta. Kindness is better than corduroy. Humility is tons better than hot pants. Meekness is strides above moccasins. Long suffering is better than long johns. Forbearance over furs any day. Forgiveness over flannel. And I will definitely take love over lace, leather, and linen. Are you dressed for today? Do you have tender mercy, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, forbearance, forgiveness, and love clothed in your inner woman? I trust you will choose tender mercies over tongue lashings, kindness over knowledge, humility over hate, meekness over malice, long-suffering over lying, forbearance over filthy communication, forgiveness over fighting, and love over lust. What will you choose to wear today? Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to deal with our inner woman. Lord, we know that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and yet often we can even fake our words. So I pray that all of us will begin that heart surgery that we need, Lord, that we would beg you to to help us to have that genuine agape love in the depth of our soul, in the depth of our heart, so that what comes out of our mouth is just naturally what's in our heart, which is love, love for you and love for others. I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.